Oh yeah, what we were saying. Ah yeah, we were saying episteme, finally. Okay. So by this concept, uh, you are trying to cover all those related system of common rules of the operation of the unconscious, okay, within the visible plane of a scientific discourse, so to speak, okay. So, now, there are several interesting concepts here. First of all, the notion of discourse, okay. The significance of these concepts in the context of Foucault's theoretical thinking uh, you know, this is a familiar concept, but it has a significance in Foucault's theoretical thinking. You know, up until the, that time, actually the whole field covering uh, the field of ideas uh, either discussed through the notions of science and scientificity of the theories on the one hand, or uh, the ideological character of ideas. You know, science on the one hand constituting all those discourses relating the truth, the other one ideological discourses actually producing a somehow misleading uh, portrayal of the reality and so on. And the difference between scientific and ideological had been predominating in the field in those times. Okay. You know, our earlier discussions primarily revolved around the question of ideology rather than discourse. Perhaps uh, within the context of this discourse, we are touching the concept, uh, significance of the concept of discourse for the first time. Okay, well, so what discourse is? You know, ordinarily speaking, Discourse is nothing else than a more or less organized bunch of speech or writing. You know? That's all. And not necessarily, you should not it necessarily to be strictly organized, but more or less you imply the idea of its systematic character at the same time. Okay? About anything, speech about anything written or spoken doesn't make much difference, okay? So this was the ordinary notion of discourse out of which there develops a certain methodology called discourse analysis, you know? However, in Foucauldian context, the term refers to something else. Actually, as you'll see perhaps later on, I'm not sure, but perhaps later on, that it's a candidate concept uh, to replace the earlier concept ideology. Okay. So you can think that within at least the Foucauldian context, the term discourse is posed in uh, contrast to the predominating conceptualization of ideology. Okay. Now, as you can understand within the post-structuralist context, it is no longer the question to ask okay, whether a text represents reality correctly or not. Okay. We are now far beyond this question. Okay. The truth itself is produced by the text, as you can see. The, any possible meaning, when I say truth, I refer to the truth of the text, which is meaning. Okay. <laughs> so, when we are talking about meaning, okay, we no longer assume a hidden hand behind the text. Rather, meaning itself yeah, has been produced by the organization of the text, by the very constitution of the text. Okay? So, but one step, if I take one step further from this idea, I would immediately arrive the idea of discourse. Okay? Now, discourse here in this context means a more or less organized, systematic piece of speech or writing, as I said, producing its own meaning, okay? its own truth. It's, so, no longer false discourse, etc., false ideology, 
or false consciousness. No longer such questions. Actually, within this course, what you trace is not what the discourse readily gives to you. Okay? Rather, within this course, what you look for is what the discourse hides from the first analysis. And what it hides really is primarily, of course, it is way of organization. Okay? So, when Foucault was talking about those hidden elements of the common unconscious, enabling a certain discourse to appear at a certain society, at a certain history, it is exactly what he means. Okay? To look, given, taking all those texts, scientific texts, and try to look through them, okay, to be able to see how they are organized according to those common principles of the unconscious. Common, common to whom? Common to those who partake in the production of a discourse. Okay? Say, a discourse on uh, what natural history. You know, prior to biology, what was at stake in those periods, okay, was natural history. What is called natural history. It is the first appearance of life sciences, so to speak, as a specific branch, okay. Now, what we see there, when we are looking at what they are doing in this field, all those scientists are doing in this field, was this, okay enumerating all the characteristics of the members of the species as much as they can and then try to classify them okay, according to a certain principle of organization in a table of creation. Hmm? Okay. So, for instance, uh, I observe a certain bird uh, having such kind of wings, such kind of legs, such kind of peaks, etc., such kind of color, and locate the place of the bird here in the family of this and that bird family, here in the family of this and that, uh, uh, other classes, okay, whatever they are. So, by establishing, locating the bird, any specific member of a species at a correct table, was assumed to give the correct knowledge of that <coughs> animal. Okay? So, yeah, and, uh, for instance, uh, I know better about humans, okay? Humans being the members of the uh, mammals group, for instance. Mammals being differentiated into these branches and uh, out of apes, etc., and out of apes, uh, under the category of apes, human beings, for instance, okay? As you can see, all these tables uh, presenting a more or less complete picture of all of the animals, and the table can be extended with uh, uh, inanimate, uh, a table of the inanimate beings as well. Okay, when you turn out to be able to locate its place over there, uh, it means that you acquire a knowledge. You know, after all, knowledge, what knowledge is? Knowledge is nothing else than being able to relate a certain something with other somethings. Hmm? Otherwise, yeah, we wouldn't be able to say knowing one single thing. Okay? We know things always and always while relating those things with other things. Okay? So, for instance, I know that uh, that color is black because I know the difference of the black from other colors. Okay? I know what black is because I know that that black is different from the other colors, which means that I arrive at the knowledge of the black by relating that black to the other colors. Okay? That saying that it's not yellow, it's not white, it's not purple, it's not this or that. Okay? So, Foucault differentiates three different epistemes, three different post-Renaissance epistemes. By the way, Renaissance taking place uh, when? Mm, when? 13, 14 centuries, which means that from 15 to 17, 17 to 18, uh, 
19 to 20th centuries, okay? Three periods and three different epistemes. Well, problem, another important problem is that the one episteme, which is following the earlier one, okay, cannot be elaborated or cannot be seen as a result of the developments taking place in the earlier one. Okay. Which means that the second episteme, say the modern episteme, is not the result of the uh, earlier modern episteme, so to speak. Okay? So, 19th century episteme is not the result of the development of the 17th and 18th century episteme. Okay? That was an important. That Foucault marks the existence of a continuous, actually very serious break there and the collapse of the earlier organization of the discourse of knowledge and it is reformation upon new grounds, completely new grounds. Okay. Now, what's the consequence of this analysis with respect to our, what we think with regard to our knowledge? There are several, you know. First of all, it and first of all, very clear. It means that knowledge is not continuous, something accumulative. Each episteme producing the conditions of possibility of certain ways of knowledge production, or certain ways of producing discourses of knowledge. Okay. Now. Handling the problem in terms of discourse then enables Foucault to put aside the question of the correctness of those discourses, questioning the truth value of those discourses, but rather than approach them as what they are, okay? as discourses, as the said something, written something. Okay? And within this said and written something, we do not care whether they do really represent reality that the nature of philosophy was right or uh, our later biology is much better than the natural philosophy of the 18th century, etc. We are not talking about this. Okay? What we are talking about is how did it happen? How it turned out to be possible that at a certain period, not one individual, not two, but a whole bunch of scholars began to produce what they call their knowledge according to such rules and principles, even without being aware of the existence of those rules and principles at the same time. Okay? So when you ask, therefore, for instance, going and asking people, okay, when you go and ask people, what Hey, brother, what are you doing over there? Okay? They wouldn't have any idea about what they were doing. That's why we call this unconscious. Okay? They wouldn't be able to tell you what they were doing. Only by putting them together and trying to find out what is common, what is operating, what causes them to be formulated in this fashion, okay? enables Foucault to trace those unconscious elements. Those unconscious elements in the formation of a discourse, but yet unconscious, but quite effective, much more effective than the conscious motives of the others. Okay? That's the crucial point. So, almost half of the book, or a third of the book, uh, has been devoted to uh, uh, this history. Uh, which culminates in the, what Foucault calls the development of the human sciences. Okay. You may think that human sciences was there from the very beginning. After all, wasn't it Plato who wrote Republic? Okay. Republic deals with complete, what we call completely human affairs. How human beings come to organize a better society for their own selves, for instance. Therefore, you can evaluate that book, Republic, at least, okay, as a book of political science, as well as book of sociology, as well as philosophy, as well as what, what a history, 
as well as anthropology or whatever you like. Okay, doesn't make much difference. But the crucial point is that Foucault's argument was that for the first time under the modern episteme, human being turned out to be uh, the object of knowledge, so to speak. Okay, for the first time, human being as a species, okay, turns out to be the object of knowledge. Now, this will actually hear this point heralding the later analysis of Michel Foucault, where later, not here, later, but I'm just uh, giving it to you in advance, analysis of human subjectivity in two senses. Okay? Now, in this book, Foucault declares that for the first time in history, the human beings began to occupy a very curious and ambi ambiguous position. What's that? For the first time, they became both, at the same time, object of knowledge and subject of knowledge. Okay? Now, this would create an impact in his later analysis of what subjectivity is, when he would say to you that we would understand, we should understand subject, the term subject, and he was right in this, in two senses. The one is the usual sense, as in the expression of human beings as uh, the subjects of knowledge. Okay? When, is, when I describe a human being, understand a human being as subject of knowledge, it simply means that okay, it is the locus, place, where knowledge occurs. Okay? And it is the locus where the object of knowledge erected before and acquired by the ground, I human being, okay? I know the thing. It is the first sense. But you know, subject has another sense as well, as in the expression of being subjected to, okay? So being subjected to the exercise of power as well, Foucault will later on would insist on this point, is what would make you a subject at the same time of the object of knowledge. Okay? So subject on the in the one sense, in its usual sense, as in subject of knowledge, the knower implied by this, the knower. But in the second sense, subject is nothing else than that which is subjugated, so to speak. Or being subjected to. <coughs> so, as a result of this shift in man's position, okay man becoming the object of knowledge under modern episteme, according to Foucault, there began to flourish what we call human sciences. Okay. Sociology, psychology, etc., etc. Okay. <coughs> and it is for the first time human beings enter into the analysis as the totality of this species under the new conceptualization of he thought there was no con such conceptualization of population. Okay. For the first time we come across with the development of the concept of population as the basic instrument in dealing with the human species in its totality in society. Okay. And now, nowadays, this is one of our sociologies, I mean, prime concepts. Now, without the concept of population, for instance, you wouldn't be able to conduct any study at all, simply because all you are working with is not in our stand a sampling of from the population, you know? A sample from the population. When you go out there, when you see people, when you interview, interview people, when you distribute questionnaires, 
what you are dealing with is exactly nothing else but a sample of the population. Okay? And without the notion of population, any sample is meaningless, as you can see. Okay? So, and then in the year 1971, end of the 60s, there comes another very interesting book by Michel Foucault called Archaeology of Knowledge. Yeah. Now, uh, I, indeed, uh, I would recommend almost all of the other books of Michel Foucault, but I would recommend you to read it at least some early stage in your uh, theoretical development. Okay? Uh, simply because that book is nothing else than accounting and giving accounts to his own self about his own up to now work, up to now, up to that time work. Okay? And when you read through it, you'll find out that he was very confused in what he was doing and he discusses that I tried this and did not succeed, I tried the other thing and did not succeed, I tried that and finally uh, come up with something like, mm, something like solution, but it appears not too much satisfactory even for his eyes. Okay. And that solution was this. Okay. Actually, this book primarily deals with the problem of the effectivity of this course. Okay. And he finally, after several failed attempts, he finally claims to find out is the, is the crucial point of his work uh, that which call, he calls the enunciation in discourse. Enunciation or statement, translated into English as statement. Okay? Now, as you can see, the peculiarity of the statement is it's being an answer to that age-old structuralist problem. We, we are going to see the same problem when we discuss uh, Jacques Derrida's views, for instance. And that's the problem. The problem is this. Okay? How, actually, we come across with it. The signification. Signification. Okay? Actually, in the, within the context of the discussions of structuralism, you know, structure is there, okay, operating this and doing this and that. But yeah, when you are studying this structure or the relations of the signifiers uh, with each other, okay, you are dealing with language. Either this is the spoken language as English or whatever, or, uh, or uh, any other series in, uh, in society, for instance, or in real life. Okay? What's important here is that whether it's not important if it's English or French or any other language, or it is the language of the traffic signs, or it is the language of the uh, class differentiations, etc., etc. Okay, it is not much important. Well, however, what's important is this. Okay, uh, the topic under question is what earlier Althusser did call as the structural effect. Okay, what is structural effect, or how structure? To put it in other words, how structure interacts with non-structure. Okay whatever you call it. Okay? Later on, this problem had been uh, discussed under the conception of force later on now, about the same years actually, we are going to discuss it later on, by Jacques, Jacques Derrida. Okay? So the basic problem is to introduce the notion of power or force, whatever you like to call it, into the discussion of the structure. Okay? In other words, how structure forms the reality. Okay. And to be able to touch upon this problem after several failed attempts, it appears that Foucault comes upon a notion of enunciation or a statement in a discourse. 
There are not many statements in a given discourse, okay? So you should not confuse that notion with that grammatical notion of sentence or something like that. A statement is that effective component in a discourse producing influence on other things, so to speak, okay? On the other components of the discourse, as well as on the components which are not part of that discursive structure, non-structure, if you like, okay? This 1971 text, therefore, constitutes the threshold for Foucault's thinking. And it is the last work which is considered to be produced within that archaeological line of thinking. From then on, Foucault would turn his attention to another different methodology which would be called genealogy. Okay? And the later works would be characterized as genealogical. Okay? 1971 was the date of that text. About four years later, there comes the other very influential book, which I myself consider as the nature work, okay, with the title Discipline and Punish, The Birth of the Prison. Okay. Now, this turns out to be a very important work, actually, in which Foucault works out his genealogical methodology, which primarily concerns the question of introducing the idea of force into the earlier developed notion of the discourse or structure. Okay. Now again, things are not devoid of structure, but now force is in the foreground in under the, as we will see, under a Foucauldian, very specific Foucauldian conceptualization of power is on the ground and it's true the operations of the force that or power that things come to organize as a structure or as something akin, close, in the likeness of structure. Okay. Now, <coughs> again, uh, this work, if you have not read it, I strongly recommend you to read it because it starts again, its, it's language is quite poetic. I like its language on my own part on the one hand, and it enters into the discussion with a presentation of a spectacular event, okay? Uh, as far as I remember, an 18th century, second, belonging to the second half of the 18th century, scene of public torture, okay? We have forgotten this. Actually, it appears that until 1950s, uh, public execution uh, was a fact in the United States and as well as I remember uh, they count some 1930s or 40s as uh, uh, the last appearances of public executions in Turkey. Ulus. Okay. Orada adamları böyle asıl eliyorlarmış. Ulus meydanını. 30'lu 40'lı yılı. <coughs> okay. So this yeah, when you read it, uh, it's not, it's impossible that you wouldn't be get affected, okay? Uh, simply because he gives you a very detailed description of that torture scene, okay? To be able to give you the idea that in those times, not in ours, our, our conceptualization of torture is quite different. In those times, torture was not something accidental, okay? was not whimsical, but rather, on the contrary, a very strictly well-defined, well-organized, calculated procedure. Okay? So, yani, it is not simply as it, as it is today. It is not simply a way to inflict pain onto the victim or to be able to establish some certain superiority of the torturer over the tortured, etc. No, no. It has nothing to do with it. And after all, when he takes a closer look at the thing, he would find out that, he would find out that, actually, uh, <coughs> torture constitutes or dominates the two phases of the punishing process. You know, one is the investigation, the establishment of the truths of the crime, etc., etc., and the other is the punishment. After you have established it, the verdict has been produced and punishment executed. You know, 
Okay. Torture here functions as the basic method in uh, the investigation of the truths of the crime as well as in setting down the punishment on the culprits. Okay. The question is why? You know, as you can see, nowadays in our modern societies, contrary to this, it appears that the predominant form of punishment is imprisonment. Okay. So the question is, Foucauldian question in that context is why about a hundred, just a hundred years ago, okay, torture was so commonplace and so well accepted instrument both as well as investigation and punishment and just some 80 years later it turns out to be a scandal. Why? Now the usual answer given to this question is this. Because we have been advanced in our considerations of humanity. In other words, we have been much more humanized, much more rational. You know? The same problem, for instance, bothers and Emil Durkheim as well. And Emil Durkheim's answer to the, this question is, uh, even though he would insist that uh, stepping almost his uh, foot on the ground, okay, he would insist that Punishment is not rational. Punishment is emotional revenge, an act of e emotional revenge. Therefore, regardless of our being modern or not, the nature of punishment remains the same. Okay? However, he had been enforced to accept that in modern societies, at least even though in the core punishment as revenge remains the same, it is forms get rationalized. Okay. So, therefore, we no longer punish that severely as our forefathers like to punish their victims. Okay. However, Foucault's answer to this question uh, is a no with respect to this. No. Okay. Punish, this is not the result of increasing rationalization, increasing rational thinking. Rather, rationality, the development of rationality, Remember a theme which he dealt with in his earlier book, okay? The development of rationality owes or should be understood under the light of the change taking place. Change taking place where? This time not taking place in the organization of discourse as it was in the order of things, but this time change taking place in the organization of power relations in society. Okay. <coughs> so, by this way, he flushes down the notion of power into whole of the analysis. Okay. So, what's at stake then is the transformation or change of the power relations prevailing in the society. Now, why torture, returning back to our earlier question, why torture was predominant just a century ago and now we cannot bear it, we cannot bear to see it? What do you think about it? First of all, do we really, are we really unable to see it today? Secondly, how do we think the place of torture is in our legal penal system. Çabuk çabuk bir iki cevap verin. Ondan sonra 10 dakikamız kaldı çünkü bir iki şey daha söylemek istiyorum. Okay. Uh, no answers therefore meaning that there is no meaning in asking questions. Okay, then uh, let me return back to my discussion, okay? Uh, under this question, what he finds, you know, we were talking about earlier framework, historical a priori, historical a priori is implying a certain constellation or if you like, organization of the elements, components, regardless of how do you understand these elements, either the signifiers, as it was in the analysis of the archaeological period, or relations of power, as it is now 
in the uh, genealogical period. Okay, so in the genealogical period, then the question of power comes to the foreground, and what we are going to look at how power is organized at a certain period. But what do we mean by this? The organization of power. Is power really organized? Can we say so? Actually, if we stick to the older uh, conceptualization of power, we wouldn't be able to see, even pose the question. You know, that older, well, yeah, don't look at am I saying or older, simply because it is still pre predominant in any sociological analysis, whatever. Okay? Power, you know, classically and modernly, and even post postmodern nowadays, mainstream sociology, is understood as the ability of someone, say, uh, a person, a Ahmed, okay, to make a person be Bekir, to accept his own will, Ahmed's will, as Bekir's, his own will, as Bekir's will, okay? So, A's ability to make B to accept A's will as B's own. Of course, uh, this such a conceptualization, Ala Weber unifies, unifies two components, okay? Capacity to use force on the one hand, but at the same time, the requirement to get consent, okay? As the ground of authority, legitimate authority, okay? So, actually, it's very simple, and this is how we understand. In our, both in our commonsensical approach, as well as mainstream sociology, tends to understand power in this way. For instance, when you start to conduct an analysis, uh, attributing the social transformations to the head of the government, actually, you are strictly following such a conceptualization of power. Well, the prime minister decreed that, okay, this got to be so-and-so, and it began to be so-and-so, okay? So, in that case, the prime minister's ability, you know, to make us accept his will as our own. Hmm? So, when you are talking about political party organization, when you are talking about uh, the corporate organization of a prime, a private firm, etc., etc., it doesn't make any difference. And you instinctually follow such a conceptualization of power. Okay. However, Foucault would develop something else. First of all, let's approach the question from its starting theoretical point. What we call power is nothing else than what has been generated in an encounter. As you can imagine, this corresponds to that difficult Nietzschean concept of force. Okay? It implies that prior to the encounter, there ain't going to be any power at all. And power or force, Nietzschean concept of force, is the function or produced by that very encounter. Okay? And attributing the generation, production of force or power to the encounter, however, implies several things. First of all, it means that it's not your ability, okay? It is not a person's ability, or it is not something a person can have to put it in his pockets or whatever, okay? To put it in his uh, door. No, one cannot have power. It is something produced in the encounter, okay? Produced in the encounter for what reason? for the ensuing inequality of the parties in the encounter, okay? Now, what the parties are, who they are, is not important. This means that each and every encounter 
produces power. Okay. We are not talking about the central concentration of power in the hands of this body or that body. Okay. Power is produced through and through between us. While we are interacting with each other in friendly or unfriendly manners, okay, doesn't matter much, okay. What is crucial, it, it is produced in friendly relations as much as unfriendly relations, okay. So, one, therefore, Foucault describes his conceptualization of power as capillary. Capillary meaning, kılcal damar demek, capillary meaning power relations are produced in the most remote recesses of our social relationships. So, power relations are not produced through the hierarchical organization of the state, political party, private corporation, etc. No, no, no. Power pro relations are produced by us, between us, okay? Through our encounters. And now, these power relations, under certain historical circumstances, assume certain systematic characters. Okay? And now, when we look at this, when we analyze the, so to speak, pre-modern society, only through an analysis of this, we can come to appreciate uh, why the panel system and the relations of power had been organized in these or those ways. Why torture, for instance, turned out to be the key in understanding that organization of the panel system in the medieval society or late medieval society, simply because what's at stake in Foucault in analysis here in this book is something coming closer to the what's usually called in literature as the absolute monarchy. Okay. We are not talking about the feudal, but we are talking about the threshold of modernity, so to speak. Would you like me to cut it here? Okay then, <coughs> let's stop here. We are going to continue with this discussion.